Hello and welcome to the main course. Dish up some food for thought. Today we are mixing the concepts of addition, subtraction, multiplication and division with the concept of dimensions to understand all of them better bit by bit. The first minute or two of the video is left fairly empty intentionally to support the idea of reduced dimensions. But in the last part of the video we will see how insightful it can be to throw all these concepts together. We will show practically and visually for a few examples why mathematical rules about multiplication, factorization and simplification make sense and how those rules look if you look past the formulas. So please watch until the end. Our everyday lives happen in three dimensions, four if you want to include time as well, but let's kick off with zero dimensions. You can think about this as a point somewhere in the three dimensional space that you're used to, but it's a point with no clue about the dimensions around it. It does not have size and is not aware of any directions. From its point of view, it's the only thing in existence. This is somewhat of a boring situation. Everything is zero and we cannot add, subtract, multiply or divide to change anything. So let's add one dimension. That point now becomes two points, a starting point and an end point, with a line in between, which has a length. In two or three dimensions, it has length and direction, but from its point of view, it only has length and is not aware of any direction. It cannot move in any direction other than on the straight line that results from extending it to both sides. But we can now add, subtract, multiply and divide. Let's define the current length of the line as one unit, represented by the number 1, and we define the position of the starting point as 0 or the origin, with the right hand side being the positive side and the left hand side the negative side. When we add, the position of the endpoint moves to one side, while it moves to the other side when we subtract. Think about the long line of possible positions as the number line. Something like plus 3 moves the endpoint 3 units to the right to lengthen it, and something like minus 6 moves the endpoint 6 units to the left to shorten it. But what happens when the endpoint crosses the origin? The line starts lengthening again, but on the negative side. The negative numbers may feel a bit strange, but maybe think about it as in the opposite direction, rather than less than nothing or shorter and longer. Subtraction therefore moves the endpoint in the opposite direction than addition would. This also makes it clear why the well-known rule a minus times a minus is a plus holds. If you want to move the endpoint minus 1 units, you have to move it in the opposite direction than plus 1 would. If you want to move it minus minus 1 units, it means you have to move it in the opposite direction of the opposite direction, which is merely the original direction again. And what about multiplication and division? They also influence the length of the line, but the basis unit with which it now is adjusted is the current length of the line, rather than the one unit of addition and subtraction. Let's call the current length x instead of 1. Something like 4 times x will make the line 4 times as long as its length at that time. This corresponds to the formula x plus 3x equals 4x. Something like divide by 2 will cut the length of the line at that time in half. This corresponds to the formula 4x divided by 2 equals 2x and is equivalent to 4x times half equals 2x. Note how multiplication and division with negative numbers flips the entire line over to the opposite side. As we see when we express 4x divided by minus 2 or 4x times minus a half as minus 2x. But someone stuck in one dimension is only aware of length and have no clue about the concept of area. It's as though such a person looks at the page of paper precisely from the side, making it look like only a line in one dimension, while there is no way of seeing what goes on on the surface of the paper. So let's add another dimension. In two dimensions, we can clearly observe the contents of the paper, or other area. Our one-dimensional line with length now becomes a two-dimensional square with sides one unit, say one meter, and area also one unit, or one meter squared. As in the one-dimensional case, we can add, subtract, multiply and divide on the x-axis, but we can now also add, subtract, multiply and divide on the y-axis. Where any point on the one-dimensional line is characterized by its length only, or distance from the origin, any point on this two-dimensional plane is characterized by two bits of information. 
its length on the x-axis and its length on the y-axis. In this case, the point x equals 5 and y equals 4. But there exists a different notation that is very useful. In my video on the Pythagorean theorem, I explain how to calculate the length of the hypotenuse of the triangle. Feel free to watch that video if you don't know how to get to 6.4. An alternative way to get to the point x equals 5, y equals 4 is to first turn in the correct direction and then pace out the length of the hypotenuse. The angle can be calculated using the trigonometric function inverse tangent of the lengths of the opposite side over the adjacent side. We're not going to go into the detail, but the angle is 38.66 degrees in this case. Let's now have a look at the so-called distributive property of addition and multiplication in two dimensions. We start with an area of 5 squares by 4 squares. There are 5 squares in each row and there are 4 rows for a total of 20 squares. We can write 5 times 4 as 5 times in brackets 3 plus 1. The distributive property states that we can calculate this in two different ways. The first is adding the 3 to the 1 and then multiplying the 4 by 5, as we've already done. The second is to first multiply the 5 with each term in the brackets and then add up the numbers. This gives 15 plus 5 equals 20, as before. We are now saying there are 3 rows of 5 and another row of 5, which is equivalent to 4 rows of 5. Instead of splitting the columns, we could also split the rows, let's say into 3 plus 2 times 4. We now multiply the 4 into the brackets and add up to get 12 plus 8 equals 20. But we can also make it more interesting by simultaneously splitting both the rows and the columns by multiplying 3 plus 2 in brackets by 3 plus 1 in brackets. Both the 3 and the 2 now needs to be multiplied into the 3 plus 1 in brackets respectively, adding everything up thereafter. This gives us 9 plus 3 plus 6 plus 2. Note how these four numbers can be represented on the area. The 3 by 3 square contributes 9 squares, the 3 by 1 rectangle 3, the 2 by 3 rectangle 6, and the 1 by 1 square 1, for a total of 20 altogether as before. A special case of this property is a formula like x plus y squared, in which the two brackets are the same. Two of the four terms are therefore squares, while the other two are equal. And this is how we obtain the special case x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. So we could see practically in two dimensions why there are four terms to add up and how these terms are constructed from the split lengths. However, someone stuck in only two dimensions is only aware of length and area and have no clue about the concept of volume. It's as though such a person observes a brick precisely from the side, making it look like a flat surface in two dimensions, while there is no way of seeing what goes on behind that surface. So, let's add a third dimension. In three dimensions, we can see what goes on all around the brick. Our two-dimensional square with area one square meter now becomes a three-dimensional cube with volume one unit or one cubic meter. We can still add, subtract, multiply and divide in the x and y axes, but we can now also perform these on the z axis. If we take four and five units on the x and y axis as before, and three units on the new z axis, we have a brick with a volume of five times four times three equals 60 cubic meters. Our distributive property can also be extended to three dimensions. We use 3 plus 2 in brackets times 3 plus 1 in brackets as before for the x and y axes, but add 2 plus 1 in brackets for the z axis. Each of the four terms of the two dimensional case is now multiplied by the two terms of the third dimension, leaving eight terms to be added up to get to 60. This corresponds to the eight parts into which the total volume is now split. It's not that easy to identify all eight of these parts in the cube in this model, but they are all there. And this brings us to the end of today's video. My model does not seem to want to illustrate four dimensions. Maybe by watching and re-watching the video a few times, we can get the time dimension included somehow. I hope I could present to you a practical, intuitive view of mathematical calculations to help you understand where some of the rules originate. Goodbye until next time.